All right, I think we will go ahead and get started. Um, welcome everyone to this uh, CMBC Center for Mind, Brain and Culture uh, lecture. Um, I'm Robert Liu, for those who might not know me, I'm a professor in the biology department um, and also associate director of the CMBC. Since this is, I think, our first time to have the CMBC talks over here at Rollins, um, I thought uh, we would go through a few um, slides to kind of explain the programming that CMBC does. Um, and this is in large part due to the efforts of some great staff that we have, Leslie Grant, who's over there, and also uh, Tamara Beck, who um, I think might be on, online right now. Uh, but the mission of the CNBC, and, and Dietz there is our director, uh, is to support and foster discussion, scholarship, training, and collaborations across diverse disciplines to promote the research at the intersection of mind, brain, and culture. So very interdisciplinary. Um, this is a list of our current leadership. And if this mission is attractive to you, we're always open to having more faculty, students, and postdocs um, reach out to us and, and join. Uh, there's various types of activities that we um, include in our programming from lectures, lunches, there's a podcast. This talk itself will be recorded and posted. Um, there's a workshop that uh, Dietz is working on for the summer. Um, and uh, also, you know, sponsoring symposia and conferences. Uh, some of the spring events that um, we're having include this lecture, um, as well as, um, uh, uh, let's see, there's um, a musical work on uh, morning in post-war Europe that's coming up. Um, we just had this Mind Meet uh, mixer on Tuesday on AI research. Um, and then I believe also Tim Griffiths is coming in the middle of March um, to talk about the rational use of, of cognitive resources. And so you can go to our website and find some more information on, on many of these uh, upcoming activities. All right, uh, a couple of other shouts out. We have a undergraduate fellows program. Um, and so we've got a few that are um, just graduating as, as well as uh, joining. Uh, we have a certificate program uh, for graduate students. Um, and then, as I said before, we have um, a sort of archive of podcasts and videos of, of many of our activities. So if you're interested in joining the CNBC, um, here's a QR code and, and you can take advantage and, and, uh, and reach out. Um, and with that, I'm going to turn now to introducing today's speaker, Michael Goldstein. Um, I'm really delighted to welcome him to Emory, or at least uh, this part of Emory, because I understand you've been here many times um, before. Okay, <laughs> all right, I stand correct. Um, he is professor uh, of psychology at Cornell, um, and I noticed he's also director of the College Scholars Program there. He was trained in developmental psychology at Indiana University in Bloomington. It's a, it's a mecca for a lot of animal behavior, developmental psychology. Um, and in fact, I think you minored in animal behavior. Um, and that maybe explains his kind of dual research role here in looking at human infants and also uh, songbirds. Uh, now he's been funded by both NIH and NSF and received numerous research uh, awards, uh, including early career awards uh, from the International Society on Infant Studies and International Society for Developmental Psychobiology. Um, but what also impressed me was that he's also earned a lot of awards for his teaching and advising, including in 2022, uh, the Stephen H. Weiss Presidential Fellow from uh, Cornell. And if you look at his CV and the huge number of honors theses of undergraduates that he served on, it's, it's pretty impressive. Now, I heard Michael talk at a Gordon Research Conference just this summer on acoustic communication and was wowed by his presentation and thought he'd be a great person to bring here. And lo and behold, he knows many of you here. So uh, without further ado, I'll turn it over to Michael and let's give him a round of applause. Thanks. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And thanks, Robert. Also, thanks, Leslie and Tamara. 
Um, you guys run a really classy operation. This has been, seriously, this has been a lot of fun. I've got a notebook full of notes on like from everybody I've been talking with. And um, I've really, I've learned a lot today. It's been a blast. And uh, thank you so much for making this a really lovely, fun uh, and engaging kind of visit. I'm gonna switch uh, things here because we already did the CNBC. And by the way, I'm really jealous of the whole CNBC. This is fantastic. And I wish we had something like this at Cornell. It's really rare to see interdisciplinary hubs that really work and really bring people together. And this looks like a really successful one. So thanks for inviting me to this. Okay. Mm. So my lab, um, as many of you know, focuses on you know vocal learning and communicative development. And I look at both songbirds, and that's the species on the left and human infants, which is the species on the right. Just, you know, I know you guys get kind of siloed sometimes, so it's good to point that out. And our findings show that young birds and uh, babies learn new vocal forms. We're focusing on vocal development today. And they learn new vocal forms when social reactions to their immature vocalizing. So that's babbling in human infants and plastic song and songbirds. When those social reactions are contingent to those immature vocalizations, so they're close together in time. And that means that immature sounds aren't just incomplete versions of what adults do. They have their own functional significance. Infants have their own job to do, their own niche, okay, which is different from that of adults. And so understanding the functions of babbling, of, of immature vocalizing, can give us real insight into underlying mechanisms of vocal learning. Um, now, this is to contrast that, the traditional kind of approach to the development of communication really assumes that complex systems come from templates um, and that development proceeds via basically just motor control, strict maturational timetables. So for example, um, good old Ernst Mayer and P actually, I really love Peter Marler. It took a while to find a picture of Peter where he looks mean. Um, <laughs> they both saw, thought that the development of song and birds was guided by an innate template. And in humans, of course, uh, Noam Chomsky asserted that the rules of grammar were basically innately specified. There's no learning there. So the inference that's in common among all of them is that complex behavior had to be grounded in equally complex internal mechanisms, that they were isomorphic. But there's plenty of examples of complex behavior arising from simpler mechanisms. So for example, these rat pups, they're born blind and deaf. They can huddle, so collectively thermoregulate, and they meet a thermal challenge that would very quickly kill any individual pup. Uh, flocks of birds and shoals of fish, uh, like these starlings and these surgeon fish, they exhibit uh, collective foraging and complex anti-predator uh, avoidance behavior that no one individual has the blueprint for. So what all these examples have in common is that the interactions are local, there's no centralized executive control. There's no king rat pup or queen mm -hmm. starling or anything like that. And the individuals don't have a blueprint for the group adaptive behavior. It's all based on proximal interactions. So my own work looks at the role of simple and local interactions um, among individuals in the development of complex and adaptive skills. In this case, the ability to do uh, vocal communication. And so to figure out how that works, we're going to start with the simplest kind of most mundane sounds that young birds and young babies make. We'll do babies first and we'll go to birds. Um, and, um, and the very kind of basic social reactions to those sounds. And what you're going to see is that none of this stuff is lit up in neon. All right. It's like, oh my God, that's the magic behavior that babies use. All right. Or birds use. It's going to be simple mundane actions and reactions that together form a complex communicative system over time. Um, and that means we got to study small behaviors at small time scales. So when we're looking at infant learning and adult responsiveness, kind of coming back to where I started, we have to ask what this stuff's for. Vocalizing is not for motor development. It's for communication. Okay. So to understand the development of a vocal learning species, it's not enough to know what's in that baby's head. We need to know what that baby's head is in. Okay. And what that baby's head is in is a social environment that affords information. At the end of the day, if I was gonna look at this from 30,000 feet, make a big theoretical claim, it's that in an altricial species, slow developers, what evolution has done is outsource critical information to the world around the baby. And the baby's job is not to sort of have a predetermined 
knowledge of how the world works because that would make you really fragile, all right? You want to be able to exploit the information that's out there so you can be a wonderful invasive species like humans, okay? <laughs> um, or starlings for that matter, all right? So we need to look at both infant vocalizing and adult responses and look at them together as a system. So we're going to start with some social functions of babbling. We want to know what aspects of immature behavior engages caregivers and what do they do? How does that inform what babies are doing? Does babbling influence the structure of parental speech? And if so, how does that come back to the infants to drive learning? So I wanna give you some of the raw material that parents have to work with. So here's some details of vocal development over the first year. So this is just a five month old uh, in my lab. And uh, this is a naturalistic play session. Babies wear little overalls with microphones in them because my favorite kind of baby is a heavily instrumented baby. <laughs> and um, so let's just watch this. So here we go. Day in the life of a five month old. Okay, that's data, all right? So a few, a few things to note about this, one, the caregiver's responses are pretty rapid and they're actually synchronized with the infant sounds. We took this about frame by frame. Babies interrupt the mom all the time. Mom doesn't interrupt the baby. She starts her utterances in between infant vocalizations. Okay, we're gonna see this in songbirds too. Um, the other thing to notice about this is that the baby's not making linguistic-like sounds. These are called quasi-resonant vocalizations. This is, this is acoustic garbage, okay? <laughs> And it's working. It's not just working on mom, by the way. It's working on all of you. I don't know if you notice as this went on, everybody starts smiling and you lean forward. You're doing everything but drool, all right? And so babies' sounds are potent stimuli. There's not a baby in this room. And that's something to think about. Now let's go forward in time. Here's a 10-month-old. Um, now you're going to hear sounds that kind of take advantage of the upper vocal tract. They have full resonance. These could be in a word, and they will be. And yeah, so mom's responding contingently to earth and sounds. The baby's using both sounds and, and eye gaze to, direct, hey, mom, I want to know about that, you know, to direct mom and get some information from the social environment, actually from the physical environment through the social environment. So taking a closer look at vocal development, because we're going to be talking about how these sounds change over time. Um, early development is characterized by quasi-resonant sounds. I'll play you an example, and that's a spectrogram of the first syllable you'll hear. And really, um, a quasi-resonant sound is highly nasalized and often is creaky. So here we go. That first syllable. Okay. I repeat them all twice. And, um, and so in contrast uh, to the, all that broadband noise you see, when we get a fully resonant sound, now the sounds can take advantage of the upper vocal tract. They're less nasalized. This is basically a prelinguistic diphthong. Okay. Yay first format, you know, change. And uh, these sounds are much more vowel-like. The baby's repertoire is greatly increased. Um, we then get to uh, marginal syllables. These are slow, sloppy transitions between consonant and vowel. They're usually over 300 milliseconds. And what you're going to hear is a little bit of pre-voicing. This is the tongue sort of smashing into the teeth um, in the middle of the vowel and kind of distorting it. Okay. It's fun having a lab where going bleh is data. And, um, and finally, as we get a little older, and there's a lot of variation around these onsets, by the way, and that individual variation is, is uh, we take advantage of in the lab. This is a canonical syllable. It meets all of the acoustic requirements of well-formed adult speech. We have a fully resonant vowel. And importantly, we have a very, this constant transition that took, you know, what is that? Like 300 some milliseconds here is happening in a fraction of that time. Okay, so from the earliest precursors, by the end of the first year, the infant's repertoire is gonna be mostly canonical syllables and fully resonant vowels. So what mechanisms cause babbling to become more and more speech-like? Most of the work out there emphasizes endogenous factors, okay? Motor development, basically. But 
At the same time, there's a lot of studies that show that the phonological patterns of babbling come to resemble that of the ambient language around nine, 10 months. These can't be unrelated, okay? How does it get there? The mechanisms underlying vocal learning have received, in humans have received relatively little attention. And so in my work lab, um, we started with looking at uh, how people respond to babbling. We wanted to know what the social sounding board was like. And we've seen that uh, contingent responding by parents is crucially responsive um, to uh, infant babbling and uh, to the development of babbling. And so I'm just gonna gloss over this. And we're gonna get to some other stuff. Um, this is a response tablet. You can click it. The babies were filmed over here. Parents can click the tablet to move closer or farther from the baby. And they would also talk. It turned out that I lost a bet to a grad student, which is great because it turned into a developmental science paper. But it turns out parents will talk to babies on the screen um, and their speech was highly revealing in ways that you will see. Um, our current, so these are called playback studies because we're playing back infant behavior. We digitally like made the, we've map, mapped on a uh, higher quality or lower quality sounds. We've made the sound socially directed or what have you. What we see is that there is strong agreement across parents about responding to clips of babies that are not their own, that they only see for five seconds. Okay. There is a great deal of consistency in how parents are responding. As you get more caregiving experience, you get more selective in what you respond to. We call this acoustic scaffolding. So a mom of a four month old hears, and she'll react to that. She'll get closer, she'll say stuff. Mom of a nine month old ignores that. She's waiting for a ba ba ba, okay? She's waiting for the good stuff. So as babies get better, mom raises the bar, babies get better, moms raise the bar. That's scaffolding. Our new versions of these kinds of studies use virtual environments. So this is a mom with goggles and she can actually wave to the baby. These control her hands. Um, she's picking the baby up right here. And uh, so we have a virtual infant um, and we're looking at um, changes in maternal auditory and visual responsiveness um, two infants in the virtual world that are babbling um, and engaging in various kinds of tests. We also found that uh, as mothers, actual infants become more uh, motorically competent, they start locomoting independently, mo these mothers become far more attuned to potential threats in the infant's virtual environment, and they will overestimate things like a car on a distant road moving by in terms of its speed and things like that. So we played baby frogger in, uh, in, in, in the lab. Okay, oh, we're recording this, oh, great. Uh, so um, now, during all of these kinds of studies, moms are talking to babies, and we analyze the linguistic structure of parental speech with contingent on babbling, both in playback studies, and the data I'm gonna show you is actually from naturalistic interaction, real moms and real babies. What we wanted to do was look at the structure of parental speech that was contingent or not contingent on babbling. Um, the study I'll show you now, we've got uh, N of 30, uh, the baby's age was about nine months, nine and a half months, and there were just 30 minute unstructured free play sessions with some toys in a big playroom. Um, contingent vocalizations were categorized as such that they were within two seconds of the offset of the infant babble. Okay, well, we first looked at what we would typically look at for infant directed speech. You know, when you talk to babies, you, you, you don't say, hi, infant, what are you doing? Okay, it's hi, what are you doing, right? And so we would have more exaggerated fundamental frequencies. We'd have higher max, lower mints, et cetera. And as you can see, both contingent and non-contingent speech, again, contingent on a babble or not contingent on a babble, they're all equally infant directed. This is all speech directed to infants. So they're very similar. However, when we look at linguistic content, we're gonna see differences. So we measure this in a few ways. We look at lexical diversity. This is just how many words, how many uh, words, unique words are in the sentence. Um, we look at type token ratio. This is lexical diversity as a function of total words. So, oh, here, right here, we only have three unique word types, but four total words. So we've got a type token ratio of 0.75. We have the le mean length of the utterance in words. We just count number of words. And then, of course, we have number of single word utterances. Here's what happens. So, we have a significantly fewer unique words in contingent speech. The speech is simpler, okay? Um, when we look at this as a function of uh, how many total words parents say, 
We have greater type token ratios in contingent speech. So that means it's less repetitive. So it's simplified, but less repetitive from utterance to utterance. Finally, well, not finally, actually, uh, we have lower MLU. So we have shorter sentences when they're contingently responding. And we have more single word utterances when they're contingently responding. Again, this is all equally infant directed, contingent and non contingent. What it means is that when babies babble, they are creating a simplified language learning environment for themselves, okay? Because they're getting simpler speech in return. Babies don't have, think about this. These are nine and a half month olds. They don't need to learn sentences. They need to learn phonology. And they're getting really nicely simplified phonological examples simply by babbling. Um, we next analyzed the, the relationship between parents' speech com complexity and infants' vocal maturity. Now, this is within a window, all right? This is word types in parent speech. And as you know, they do fewer word types in contingent speech than non-contingent. So non-contingent will be way over here somewhere, and then this breaks down. But in the sweet spot of contingent word types, we see a significant positive relation between the word types and how complex the infant vocalizations are. So they're incorporating more consonant vowel structured syllables into their babbling when we're, they're getting an increased number of word types. But again, if you go off the top, right, and for the non-contingent, then this breaks down and you don't see it. So there's a sweet spot here. We don't know how the sweet spot changes over time yet. That's something we're working on. Okay, so the structure of parental speech is influenced by vocalizing. Uh, they're simplifying their speech along several parameters. And um, we didn't find differences in pitch contour, any of those super segmental features that characterize infant directed speech. It's all happening in terms of linguistic structure. Now, that's nice. That's English. Then the pandemic hit. We said, what are we going to do with this? Well, let's get on children's. So now we uh, can go global, all right? And we analyzed um, a number of corpora from the Childers database um, in all of these regions. And what we found uh, across 14 different languages um, is the same pattern. Now, there are some challenges here. So for example, Polish, we don't see a difference between contingent and non-contingent number of unique words, um, but we only have one transcript from Polish. We have some power issues with a few of these languages, and I'll highlight that in a minute. But for the most part, we see, again, fewer unique words in contingent speech across a lot of languages. Not all, but a lot. Um, MLU, same thing. We have reduced ling lengths of utterance in words um, when it's contingent in many of the languages we looked at. We see a similar pattern again in single word utterances, more single word utterances in contingent speech. This is looking pretty robust. And in fact, when we, um, here, summarizing everything you just said in, a, in terms of you know, green checks and red Xs, um, again, Polish, we've got a power problem. And in fact, same thing with Persian. But the languages where we have a decent number of transcripts, we're seeing pretty robust. It's not always every parameter, but it's most of the parameters across a lot of languages distributed across five different linguistic groups. Okay, these are all weird cultures. You guys know what weird means now, right? Maybe the people in bio haven't run into this as much, but it means white, educated, industrialized, rich, and democratic. What about a non-weird culture? So we paired up, uh, collaborated with uh, Mindy Casillas. Where is she? Um, yeah, what about non-weird? We paired up with Mindy Casillas um, who had lovely data from the um, Tesla Mayan. And this is a community that's known for being quote unquote stoic around babies. There's no infant direct, very little infant directed speech. So you don't see those pres exaggerated prosodic changes. Uh, they don't even do that much direct face to face, you know, kind of Western style parent infant interaction. They talk around babies all the time. So we got recordings of 10, 10 uh, children's daily routines, a lot of, lot of speech here. We got hour long transcripts. And what we did, whoops, before I give that away, hang on. Well, you can, I just gave it away. So um, what we found was the same exact pattern as in the Western groups, okay? Again, contingent speech has lower unique words. It has shorter mean length of utterance, and it has more single word utterances. So what I like to say in altricial species, especially, parents aren't trying to teach. Babies aren't trying to learn. But that's exactly what's happening here. 
okay? Parents are being influenced by babbling in ways they are simply not aware of. And even in a culture that doesn't do anything presumably special with their infant-directed speech, they are significantly simplifying their speech to infants. The infants are still, by babbling, creating this language learning environment that's simplified. Okay, so back to the question we started with. Our findings suggest that babblings may babbling may function to organize caregivers' behavior, makes them more contingent, and it creates this temporally predictable and statistically learnable information. So does this actually affect the babbling that babies make? I've showed you some correlational data, but what we really need to do is manipulate it. And that's kind of how we've made our name is by doing manipulations of maternal behavior in real time to infants and studying learning. Okay, so we've done this for a while. And we found several kinds of positive impacts of parental responsiveness on babbling and basically the earliest stages of language development. Um, we know that um, uh, vocal development is facilitated by contingent maternal responses. I'll show you how we do this study in a minute, but basically we can make, make moms more contingent or we can have yoke control. So babies get all the same responses from mom, but it's not synchronized with their babbling and they don't learn. Um, the, uh, we've done this with silent responses. We get these global changes in babbling. We've done it with give them vowels or consonant vowel utterances, and babies will learn more of those utterances. Um, we've uh, also done this with word learning. So if you label objects contingently on a babble, babies are more likely to learn the object word pairing. Um, and that in doing that is actually naturalistically is associated with increases in vocabulary size. And what we think is going on is that Babbling is kind of the acoustic equivalent of a furrowed brow. It sort of indicates interest socially. And it's a moment of higher arousal. It's a moment of focused attention. And so what that means is when you have a contingently responding adult, they're providing information at exactly the right time for it to be learned. Okay. And, and we've done this with a lot of controls. So, you know, we can give babies, uh, you know, made up objects. And you look at the object and you give them like every 40 seconds, you just mug the baby, take the object, give them a new object. And you take the object that got the most babbling and the least babbling, all right? Then you put up on the screen, the object in a visually distorted version. And do the babies notice there's a visually distorted version? They only notice it for the objects that got the most babbling, okay? And that's with looking time held constant, controlled for. Vocalizing is happening at moments of focused attention and learning is facilitated as a result. So we think that what babbling is doing, a contingent responding to babbling is doing, is highlighting statistical regularities in language. Okay? We have a lot of data around that idea. What we need is data that actually attacks that idea directly. So what we came up with was a way to give babies novel phonological regularities. And we could see if they would be better learned when they're being presented contingently versus on yoke schedules. Here's how we did it. And this is actually based on work I did back in Meredith West and Drew King's lab on brown-headed cowbirds at Indiana University. I actually started as a baby guy, I'm sorry, as a bird guy. Um, and I did bird work for a while and, um, and then had this realization that babies babble. <laughs> um, I did this because a couple of my undergrads took me to a mall for a clothing intervention. I was, look, I was working on birds. I didn't care. I'm better now, right? But I was working on birds and, and they're like, Mike, you need clothes with no holes in them. I'm like, oh, whatever. And they made me do this. We come out of like an old Navy and across the hall in the Bloomington Mall is a baby in a stroller, mom kneeling in front of it, baby's babbling its head off. Mom's going, oh, really? Oh, you want the bottle, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, wow, that's almost as time locked as cowbirds. Okay. <laughs> and wow, babies have plastic song. Like, I didn't know. And, um, and I'm like, there must be a huge literature on social responses to vocal learning in humans, just like we were doing with brown-headed cowbirds. I'm like, why aren't we citing this to support our, our NSF grant renewal? <laughs> and my advisors were like, well, go look for it, Mike. <laughs> Nothing, okay? I mean, there's all this canary and shaping stuff, but that really wasn't what we're looking for here. So Meredith and Wes, to her great credit, let me open up a baby lab. And I switched gears right in the middle of grad school. And all of what you're seeing is the result of that. It made my career. Okay, so based on the bird work, what we do, we bring them in the day before for a 30 minute familiarization period. That's just to allow the time for mom and baby to get used to the room. 
Um, it looks just like in those videos. We're in a 15 by 20 foot room. It's really important to have a big room. Let babies get distal from mom. They're not locked into a social interaction. The second version is an ABA design. We've got a baseline. We've got either contingent or yoke social responses. And I'll show you how that works in a minute. Um, then we have a second baseline. Okay. And during the baselines, they're asked, just play at home like you naturally would. And then during this middle um, social response period, I'm manipulating the interaction in ways that I'll tell you about. During this, we analyze rate, resonance, and consonant vowel articulatory timing or phonological regularities, depending on the study um, of what's going on in babbling. And so, um, you know, the testing room is big, like I mentioned. Um, now we use wireless earbuds. This is an older photo. Mom's wearing little headphones uh, so that baby can't hear me talking to mom, but mom can still hear her baby because you don't want the voice of God coming over the speaker and presenting a confound in your study. And so moms think these are studies about a little social game we're going to play. They don't know it's about babbling. And I just say every now and then, I'm going to say a funny word in your headphones. When you hear that word, get closer, smile, touch your baby, but say the word. The rest of the time, just keep playing. Okay. That's it. So we're just adding a little something on. And again, baby's got a little microphone in here and a little wireless transmitter. Okay. So during that social response period when the manipulation takes place, I ask moms in the contingent group, again, like I was saying, to get closer, smile, touch their babies. And by the way, these are behaviors that are based on lots and lots of observations we've done that are naturalist about what moms were doing when babies were babbling. Now we need to separate the effects of contingency from stimulation being caused by mom's responses. You don't wanna just poke the baby and make it babble, okay? So what we have are yoke controls. So they have the same form and the same timing of maternal responses, but it's not synchronized with babbling. So if a contingent baby comes in and in a minute and 37 seconds, baby babbles, I say to mom, I give her a stimulus to present to the baby. Um, when the yoke control baby comes in a little, you know, the next day or something, at a minute 37 seconds, mom gets the same instruction. So baby gets the same stimulation. The baby didn't just babble that. There's a little chance contingency, but it's never much. Okay. So they, we control for the amount and type of stimulation. So we've done a series of these. And what we found is that contingent interactions facilitates real-time acoustic changes in babbling that move sounds towards mature forms. Uh, the yoke controls never learn in these studies. So if we let them do contingent but silent responding, we get more fully resonant vowels and we get more canonical syllables, uh, those stages I was telling you about before. By the way, these studies we generally do with nine month olds because they're at a point of sort of maximum acoustic variability in their babbling. The system's at a point in transition where canonical syllables are starting to dominate. So we, when you're at a point in transition, that's where you shove the system in different directions and you see what it's actually responsive to. Um, when we give them, it turns out moms actually tend to speak when they're responding to babbling. And so when you let, when we control that, if babies that get fully resonant vowels in response to babbling make more fully resonant vowels, babies that get more consonant vowel articulations make more consonant vowel articulations. Um, an important point here is that babies aren't imitating. They're not mimicking what moms say. A lot of people talk about imitation as a quote unquote mechanism of uh, sort of social and cultural transmission. But imitation in my view is a description of a developmental outcome. It means I did something, something like you. It's not a box in the head that gets you somewhere. That's a nominal fallacy. That's taking the description of an outcome and saying that that's now the mechanism that got you. That's completely circular. You can build imitative outcomes different ways. And we'll talk about that. But babies will pick up on the underlying phonological patterns of the moms in these studies, but they're not using the same phonemes that moms use, even when we know those phonemes are in their prelinguistic repertoires because we measure it the day before. Okay, so let's give them something totally novel to learn. What we used was feedback from the Nigerian language Yoruba. Okay, and the reason we did this is because those Yorban words addressed to infants typically have a vowel consonant vowel form, like Anu, or Aba, Ima, things like that. We know there's a couple of studies that track early vocal development in urban infants. 
And what they see is that the early disyllables, the early two-syllable utterances, they're not gaga and mama like babies do here. They're aga, ama. Okay, so babies are perfectly capable of learning this. They don't do it very often here. There's some work by Kim Haller doing it in Korean, actually. And that would have been much easier for me to get samples of than Yorba, but I just didn't know because he only <laughs> recently published that paper. And, um, but we presented this either on contingent or yoke scheduled infants. And I'll give you an example of what this sounds like and looks like. You're going to hear the baby just babbled in this video. And, um, You'll hear experimenter cueing mom. You'll hear mom saying something and then baby. Experimenter. Oh, baby. Let me do that again. Miss the piece. There's experimenter. Um, and there's baby. So the baby does a vowel consonant and vowel, but it's not the same phonemes that moms use. And that's going to get important. And it's nice to have a study where you get effects that you don't have to cherry pick the videos like the babies are just doing this, um, as I'll show you. So we have different input conditions. So the mechanism we think that's at work here is what I call socially guided statistical learning, all right, where statistical segments or chunks in the input are being made more salient because of social contingency. And if that's the mechanism, then we need to have variability in the input to highlight the underlying regularity. Um, and again, if you're trying to learn by mimicry, this is going to be impossible because you're getting different words every time. Okay. At the same time, we have a condition where we get the same Yorban word every time. So here, if you're statistical learning, that's going to be like trying to figure out the category of chair from looking at all the chairs which are identical. You're not going to get anywhere. Um, but if it's mimicry, this should be really easy. And of course, we have yoke controls to these conditions as well. Okay, here's the data. Um, what we have here are the three 10 minute periods, the baseline, social response, baseline two. This is the proportion of babbles that have that vowel consonant, vowel, Yoruban phonological structure. And what you see is a significant increase from baseline to social response. And then actually, there's a bit of a carryover here, staying at a similar level into baseline two. We've now starting, now that COVID's over, we're finally gonna start some longitudinal studies where we're combining lab sort of probes like this with uh, Lena recordings, which are little wearable microphones basically and, and, and rec long-term recorders that babies can wear at home. Uh, so we can track this over developmental time a little better. Here's the condition where they get the same word every time. This is 100% variability, different word every time. Same word every time we've got noise, but we yeah, they're going back and forth, but we're not showing patterns of learning. Yoke controls, we don't see learning either, okay? And I've combined my yoke control groups, but you don't see them in the individual groups. An easier way to look at this um, is uh, a more direct comparison. This is mean change score from baseline to social response in your phonological structure. And only the infants in the 100% variability condition changed the proportion of babbles that had that form. And it's a pretty strong change compared to the other groups. Okay. So babies are picking this up in real time. However, I still wanted to ask if babies might be learning by mimicking preceding maternal utterance. Um, actually, I didn't want to ask it. All the reviewers make me ask that. I, I figure I feel like this battle is done, but it's got a lot of staying power. So um, as you can see, here's our observed matching chance level, which we get by shuffling all of the maternal and infant uh, uh, vocalizations, and we look for chance matching. It's not any different from chance. This is true of all of the vocal learning studies we've done. And so what we think is happening here is infants are generalizing the urban phonological structure to new forms. Okay, they've learned this pattern. Now, what we have to do now, we've done 0% variability. We've done 100% variability. Well, is this graded or is it, you hit some set point and whammo, they've got it. We don't know. And that's a real debate in the literature and other forms of statistical learning or what Gary Marcus would call algebraic rule learning. So we're currently running 25, 50, and 75% variability um, to assess um, what statistic, socially guided statistical learning might look like in these infants. Okay. By the way, this is all variability in terms of content. We're also running so vocal learning studies where we vary the uh, predictability of the contingencies themselves. And if we have time at the end, I have a couple of slides to show you about that. 
Um, we have some ideas that come from machine learning on what's called curiosity driven learning, um, where the idea is contingency matters because babies by emitting behavior make the social environment more predictable. And having better prediction accuracy is intrinsically rewarding that we've seen in a lot of models. We'll get to that. Okay, so we call this socially guided statistical learning. The idea is that they're picking up on statistical regularities in mom's speech, such as vowel consonant, vowel patterns, but not the surface characteristics of specific phonemes, like mom said ba or mom said d. That seems to be uh, not what's informing what babies are doing. We also know that data from the yoke control groups indicates that the timing of feedback is critically important. Okay, so mere exposure doesn't cut it. It's got to be contingent on the babbles. So we've gone on from there. It turns out this is all serve and return. Babies babble, moms does something. A lot of social interaction work looks, looks like that. But of course, that's not the way it really goes. Those of you who do bird song know about counter singing bouts, right? You don't just have a song and somebody does another song and people, everybody wanders off, right? It's back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Things get synchronized, then they desynchronize, then they resynchronize. So we decided to look at that. So first of all, it turns out that uh, moving beyond individual syllables, um, we did a longitudinal study of vocal learning, both five and 10 months. We have individual syllables versus sequences of syllables. And moms respond significantly more to sequences of syllables. Okay, that seems to be much more of a much more salient to them. It tends to be more potent in driving social responsiveness. And that actually has an effect on the development of infants' production of babbling sequences. So what we've talked about now is like one and two syllable utterances, right? Well, it turns out the sequences get faster when parents respond to them. This is a really cool idea. So a property of vocal sequences is basically information transmission rate. That's syllables per second. And sequence compression develops over time. You can see we've got more syllables per second in the older babies. So what role does social learning play in that? Well, it turns out that caregivers' interruptions of sequences inhibits se um, sequence compression. So what we have here is a um, proportion of sequences interrupted at 10 months and the developmental change in sequence compression. So you're seeing fewer syllables per second as there are more interruptions. So babies seem to be not speeding up when they have moms that are a little more intrusive in their, in their uh, interruptions of sounds. Because um, this is something that formally has been basically attributed, you know, babies are just practicing a lot, they're getting faster articulations. Well, it turns out it seems to be linked back to social responsiveness. Um, looking ahead in development, um, we actually find that uh, infant's compression level at 10, so syllables per second at 10 months, is predicting productive vocabulary as measured by the MacArthur Communicative Development Inventory at 18 months. So here we are going from prelinguistic to early words. And these are obviously correlational findings. Okay, that these are connected. And now what we're doing is looking at effects on contingent, on con, of contingent responsiveness on vocal learning in that paradigm I just described to you. Okay, so we're gonna manipulate that. And so what we think is going, and I have actually some more data on that that I'll show you along with our bird song work, because we have parallel studies for everything I've showed you in songbirds. And so what we think is going on here is a social feedback loop. And the idea is that um, babies are vocalizing. Caregivers are highly responsive to this. And our playback work in a lot of different paradigms has shown that. And again, I didn't focus on that very much. I focused on the linguistic simplification effect. But that's happening in a context of very reliable responding to babbling. So when caregivers react in our vocal learning studies, it shows that babies are modifying their sounds as re in real time as a result of that feedback. And they're picking up on phonological regularities in that feedback. Well, these are exactly the changes in more developmentally advanced directions. Again, this acoustic scaffolding idea, and that causes moms to be more likely to react to those sounds in the first place, uh, in the second place now, as we spiral outward. So as this process continues, it affords infants really structured feedback, both in terms of temporal structure and in terms of content structure, because it's simplified. And that feedback is influencing in both real time and developmental time, the structure of their, vocal, of their vocalizations, the structure of their babbling. 
Um, where we're going with this right now is I've got a new collaboration with Sarah Botcher. She's a birdsong uh, researcher. Um, we've actually set up a baby lab at USC in her old microscope room, much to the chagrin of her graduate students who are like, mm -hmm. what are you doing to us? Um, and what we've done is we've taken the social feedback loop. We're working with a surgical team in, in Los Angeles, um, looking at vocal learning and parental responsiveness to sounds before and after cochlear implantation. Okay. Um, cochlear implants give you access to sound. They don't necessarily give you access to learning. And we're dealing with parents who have had months and months and months of exposure to babbles where it doesn't matter what they do. The babies aren't really going to be changing their sounds as a function of social feedback. They can barely hear themselves. What happens when that implant is turned on? What do their sequences look like? What does responsiveness look like? Well, we know actually responsiveness is kind of detuned. So we put them in our vocal learning paradigm and we tune them up. And we're going to see what happens as a result of that. So we're running babies right now. Um, and this, of course, begs the question is why contingency matters so much in the first place. And what we think is that certain characteristics of interaction, um, like infant-directed speech, like contingent timing, um, are highly motivating and rewarding to infants. And that reward pathways may mediate the saliency of information. They basically serve like metadata tags on chunks of speech that are coming in contingently. This is from a paper, by the way, of Supriya Sial, former student of mine, and Barbara Finlay from 2011. It's called Thinking Beyond the Cortex. It's in developmental science. I strongly recommend reading this. It's a lot of fun. Um, and what you have here are these dopaminergic connections, this basal ganglia thalamic cortical loop. Um, and this is sort of a highlight of the basal ganglia areas that we think is, are serving an important role in um, driving cortical representations of particular sound forms, okay? The idea is that the striatum is involved in control of speech motor output. The importance of this region speech control has been supported by studies, um, actually with Parkinson's patients and others, showing its association also with syntactic and semantic processing. We're really interested in knowing how reward signals, because of like, I, I think something's going to happen in my social world. I babble, look, it happened. I've made noisy social behavior more predictable. How the reward signal from that is influencing auditory representations. Okay. The, the other, of course, reason contingency may be, may be mattering is that the adult model and the infant immature version are very close together at time, allowing for comparisons. And so the idea then is that reward motivational pathways that are basically activated during social interactions are highlighting specific statistical regularities. Now, this is all sounding very speculative as to why contingent interaction might be rewarding. So what we need to do is look at a model system where we can actually manipulate those reward pathways. And I'm going to show you the early stages of that work, um, which is not in humans, but it's rather in a socially gregarious songbird, the zebra finch. Okay. Um, the zebra finch, as many of you know, is a widely studied model species for the neurobiology of vocal learning. Um, uh, they're socially gregarious. Song is really important in female attraction. Um, learning is more effective from live tutors than from uh, tape tutors. And juveniles have a preference to learn their father's song. And actually, if you swap fathers out, they'll learn so the song of the bird that's taking care of them, which is a hint and a half right there. Um, in the wild, you know, zebra finch colonies can have many nests in close proximity, but they'll learn the song of the dad that's providing the care. And um, now, Vocal learning in these guys is typically developed, uh, divided into two phases. You have an early sensory period, that's where they can memorize new songs, and you have a later sensory motor period where they're actually doing subsong and plastic song, the immature vocalizations, the analogy to babbling there. Um, and then finally, they crystallize out at day 120 post hatch. What we're really interested in is this sort of area of the blue box between day 35 and 75. This is the overlap between sensory and sensory motor periods. And what that means is that it, there are opportunities here for responses to immature vocalizing to influence the auditory representation. I really don't like the word template, okay? It means fixity. And to give Peter Marler some credit, he was studying song sparrows where, you have a, where it doesn't look like there's this much overlap. In a song sparrow, you have an early sensory motor period, a much later sensory motor period. They don't have overlap. 
But guess what? Not everybody's a song sparrow, okay? Other species have more overlap, like the zebra finch. But people still tend to talk about it as there's this template they memorize. And that's then everything they need to do is really endogenous to go match the template. Well, I was really curious about this, especially once I read a Lucy Eels paper that showed by day 50, if you switch tutors, they'll learn the new song. What's driving this? So I think there's opportunities for social reactions to plastic song to influence song development. I was coming out of a brown-headed cowbird lab where we were looking at non-vocal maternal reactions to plastic song in cowbirds, and that males were using this information. Um, could this be happening in other species? And I remember asking my advisor, and she goes, well, nobody's looked. And the problem with cowbirds is they're brood parasites. They're weird birds. So people haven't really generalized those lessons. So I decided to look. And so here's an example, uh, for those of you who aren't familiar with zebra finch, of what a typical song sounds like. We have a few introductory notes followed by uh, motifs that can be repeated anywhere from one to 20 times. Here it is. Now that's, a, that's beautiful, isn't it? Um, and I noticed you guys weren't leaning in and smiling when, when you hear that. Um, now, that is a developmental outcome that you just heard. That's at 120 days post hatch. That's when the songs crystallize. Here's the same bird at day 39. Okay, we have acoustic garbage. So not as many people study that because it's really hard to identify any kinds of structures there. Same problem with babbling. So again, going from that to this, is a huge amount of acoustic remodeling in a relatively short amount of time. So what developmental mechanisms are driving those changes? Same questions we ask in the baby lab. So what we wanted to do is manipulate social, inter actually we first observed social interactions in those birds. And we saw behaviors from both the adult male in terms of continued singing and behaviors from adult females, the mom, that were non-vocal. Females don't sing in this species. Okay, that we thought that, that actually looked highly contingent on the bird's immature vocalizing. And when we did some, uh, we did correlations with outcomes, we found that the proportion of plastic songs that produced sort of female non vocal responses that was positively correlated with the outcome measures. But that's just correlation. So we'll get to what we did with that. So here's an example this is called a wing stroke. And this was first found in brown headed cowbirds. Now we've seen it in the female. Here we go. This is a big moment in the life of a juvenile male. <laughs> Here we go. Yeah. Not exactly lit up in neon. But what you got to remember is that this behavior isn't built for your eyes. Okay. This is a 90 millisecond to 100 millisecond behavior that's built for a bird who can perceive this. Okay. Again, one more time because it's so exciting. Right. So... What we found longitudinally is proportion of plastic song to get those behaviors, along with a bigger behavior, it's called a, a fluff up, the feathers kind of oof, okay? It's a little longer of a behavior. That was positively correlated with the match to tutor. These are non-vocal responses, okay? And again, we've seen this in cowbirds. We've seen this in human infants. So what we do are three different kinds of studies right now. Um, we've done work with Nicole Buran, uh, where we can do intracranial injections of vasotocin agonists or antagonists, and we look to see how that changes social motivation and song learning. Um, we've also done um, uh, contingent versus yoke control um, auditory playbacks, audio playbacks of a uh, of song. Uh, it turned, that's kind of hard to do. The birds don't learn well to take tutoring. So we have we had a stuffed bird here, and then we had to put it, they, that worked for a little while, and then go, hey, that's a stuffed bird. Um, and so then we have like a piece of cheesecloth, so it's like bird in the mist. And, um, and then we found that contingent playbacks on plastic song re resulted in better match to tutor than frequency match uh, yoke controls. And, um, and the one I'll tell you about in a little more detail in the time we have left is this setup where we've got a video screen. I, called, I used to call it bird Skype, and now I have to call it bird Zoom because mm -hmm. Skype lost. And uh, where we present female feedback via a video screen, and that allows me to control her behavior. Okay, so a little more here. Um, what we have is uh, each bird's got a monitor. It's in a sound attenuation chamber, and we've got like racks of these things. 
And uh, this is connected to a computer um, so that we can present uh, fluff up behaviors contingently or on a yoke schedule to plastic song and the birds. So we had a baby study that was inspired by, inspired by bird studies, which has now inspired a new generation of bird studies. Did I say that right? Went bird, baby, bird, right. Uh, we do the playback during days 40 to 60. It's right in this overlap period between sensory and sensory motor periods when I think they should be sensitive to social feedback. And what my naturalistic correlational longitudinal studies indicated would be a critical period for social learning. Here's how it works. Okay, we've got two brothers. They were reared by the same dad up to day 30 when they then split up and put into two different sound attenuation chambers. When the contingent brother sings, yay, um, he gets a female fluff up on a video screen contingently. At the same moment in time, his brother in a different chamber gets the same video. So they have just as much, their brothers to control for genetic effects, they get just as much stimulation. The stimulation is non-vocal. Um, in one group, it's uh, the wing strokes that I showed you, and we also have these feather fluffs. Um, we also have a control with a blue dot that I can tell you about. I'm going to show you the data right now from the published version of this, which is the fluff ups. Here's actually I'm going to I'm going to play you the, the data and then I'll show you the data. Okay, here's dad. Okay, here's a contingent juvenile that only got non-vocal feedback. Pretty close. Here's his brother who got yoked feedback. That's not good. Okay, that sounds like isolate song, actually. That's really um, very impoverished singing. And here's what the data actually show. So we've got contingent in blue, yoke control in green, and this is percent acoustic similarity to tutor that we use sound analysis pro to measure. And you can see significantly better matched tutor in the contingent condition. This graph on the right has all of our brother pairs all except one goofball here is moving in the correct direction where the uh, contingent bird is doing significantly better than the yoke, than, than his yoke brother. And by the way, this is not an effective practice as both groups of birds sang at similar rates. So it's not about volubility, it's about learning. Okay, remember we talked about sequence compression before a little bit. So we've got our first paper under review that actually has data from both birds and babies in it. So the idea is that we see similar results as the human infants um, in uh, sequence compression in the zebra finch. So this is syllables per second in our contingent yoke birds. It's not a huge effect, but it's, it's a statistically significant one. And then when we look in just the contingent birds, different contingent birds in the study I just showed you have received different amounts of playback because it's dependent on how much they're singing. All right, the more contingent songs that got a response um, is significantly correlated with increases in syllables per second. And again, we can control for amount of singing and we still see contingent birds getting more. So having established the role of contingent feedback in vocal learning, what we're doing now is I'm going, I'm basically a graduate student again. I don't think I can give myself enough credit to even be a postdoc at this point. Um, and I, we're, we're learning how to manipulate reward circuitry in the brains of young learners. And, um, and those are all studies that we're just setting up to do. And as the idea here then is we flesh out our understanding of social interactions and their effects on learning. We're identifying, we want to identify pathways by which social interaction influences song development. Going back to why does contingency matter? The idea is that in the songbirds, we can measure the basal ganglia interface with the anterior forebrain pathway, interface with the song learning system via dopaminergic connections to see how birds are integrating vocal signals, I'm sorry, visual signals with a vocal output to be learned. And so the idea, we're really interested in Jesse Goldberg's work where he's got dopaminergic connections between VTA and area X and Vikram, his students work um, on, uh, uh, on the role of VTA in uh, directed versus undirected song. But that's all in adult birds. We wanna look at this in juveniles. That's a goal. It's gonna be a while before we get there. Um, juvenile brains are 
tougher targets. Those of you who are doing fizz are got, got these grins like, oh, Mike, you're really going like, to hate yourself for doing this. But I think the goal is worth it. Uh, we're going to start off um, by um, basically uh, lesioning dopaminergic production, dopaminergic production to HDC. Um, we know birds will still sing. I know there's some issues that might interfere with learning. We'll have control tasks to deal with that. But we want to see um, both if we can influence how females produce non-vocal feedback and how males can perceive non-vocal feedback um, in early development um, to see just how these how contingency might be influencing communicative development in the, in the brains of these birds. So the idea then, remember that social feedback loop I showed you earlier. The idea is that the social feedback loop that informs early language learning has underneath it a neural feedback loop between that's organized by immature vocalization between basal ganglia and kind of cortical areas um, that is bringing reward processing into complex vocal behaviors such that social feedback that's predictable is then rewarding and is then influencing vocal learning in real time and developmental time. So to sum up, um, by building a more integrative understanding, by integrative, I mean levels organization and comparatively across species. By building that integrative understanding, by connecting patterns of both parental responsiveness to infant learning, we're getting a more mechanistic understanding of how vocal learning actually works in the social context that they're built for um, in both real time and developmental time. These systems of action and interaction uh, in behavior that are, again, underlined by um, basal ganglia and sort of limbic areas to cortical areas, uh, kind of neural feedback loops, I think are what are really allowing really simple behaviors, mundane vocal behaviors that are not well formed, interacting with maternal behavior or caregiver behaviors that also don't are not exactly lit up in neon. It's what allowing those to become synchronized and elaborative, elaborated into really smart and adaptive skills of early language learning, early communicative development. And so I just like to think we've got baby teams and bird teams in the lab. Uh, we have many graduate students that have been part of this research program. Samantha Caruso did the um, uh, video feedback. Katarina Faust has done work on uh, pair bonding showing that um, birds that are higher in exploratory behavior are also more um, attentive to their offspring's plastic song. Um, Steven Elminger did all the vocal compression work. Emma Murugara is doing the virtual playback experiments with the uh, adults. Uh, and Jennifer Schwade has been involved in a lot of the infant work as, as Julia Venditti. Uh, Celia McLean is starting our new neuroscience work in the lab um, and has been looking at some of the sequence compression work in the bird song. And Vivian Zhang um, is doing the sequence compression work and turn taking work in the human infants. And I also want to thank my funders. We have the Center for Social Sciences at Cornell, the NSF, and NICHD. And thank you. Very lovely talk. I think uh, even though you kind of um, you know, mentioned the ethologists and, and how you're challenging some of their early um, ways of thinking about it, I would say you've shown very nicely how ecological approaches, really looking at the natural behavior, yeah, is so important to actually understand. Yeah, that's where we felt we needed to start. You know, um, it's really where we felt we needed to uh, we need to understand what the behaviors look like in context. In fact, I, and I'll give credit to Meredith West and Drew King. When I came out to Bloomington, they said, okay, we know you have like, thoughts and ideas and you mm -hmm. talk a lot and whatever. Don't tell us anything about cowbirds you watch them for 500 hours. I was like, shit. So I'm in the, we have aviaries out there that are 93 meters long, they're the length of a football field, okay? And I'm out there with binoculars for 500 hours. And you know what? That really informed what I thought was going on. And then when I wanted to open up the bird lab, they're like, Mike, 500 hours. And I'm like, look, they're con specifics, okay? Can I have like a little credit? And they're like, okay, how about 150 hours or something? Fine. 
And, um, and again, something hit me when I was watching them. A lot of the maternal responsiveness literature is about maternal attributions about the babies or maternal um, sort of cognition. And what I learned in the moment was baby would babble. And at one point, like I would get up or I wouldn't. I'm like, wait a minute, what did I just do? I wasn't thinking. Babies don't care what I think. They care what I do. I need playback experiments that capture actions, not attributions. And that led us to a completely new place. And that's what led us to the vocal learning. But yeah, you got to start with the behaviors and context and go from there. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, well, when you're talking about uh, uh, the importance of contingency and learning and influence and Sandra, it made me think of some of the, uh, the work uh, people like Suzanne Digger and uh, Uri Hassan with yeah. kids and adults and individual alignment and all that. Yeah, and the brain to brain coupling. Were, yeah, and you were speculating about mechanisms, but a lot of that works basically correlational also. And I was wondering, yep. do you think that you're talking about the same sort of mechanisms or is this a different thing? Or? I mean, okay. Um, I think Yuri and I are, I think, will be on the same page. Um, the problem is we're doing, we're looking at different ages and we're using different levels of organization. And I mean, the thing about their brain-to-brain -brain coupling work is that it's going through a behavioral interface that they never talk about, right? It's not brains magically reading other brains, right? What's the behavior actually look like? I mean, what are different modalities of, of contingency, for example, leading to different amounts of coupling. Like we don't have answers to that. And uh, so Elise Piazza, who is a student who's now up at Rochester, we're having her come down soon because we, we want to we ask the same exact kind of question. Um, and they're also not really looking, I and mean, the problem is with EG, you know, are you getting basal ganglia signal? Like what's really going on? It's more cortical, right? Yeah. Right. So it's hard and to know. I think that it's, it's, it has to do with this sort of motivational, attentional flag similar yeah. mechanism. I think it does. I mean, so we want to, so with Leslie Carver at UCSD, we're starting a new collaboration with, um, eventually we're going to be looking at uh, kids at risk for autism with this, but they have neurals, they have EEG signatures of prediction. Okay. And I'm really interested in seeing if, as infants gain control of a stimulus by vocalizing, will we also see that signature of prediction? Now that won't be a complete answer to your question, but it would be a start to bring this across level of organization without having to jump species to do it. I think at the end of the day, Basil Ding was playing a crucial role here um, because you know work by uh, Jackie Gottlieb at uh, Columbia um, really shows that Prediction reward signals that are basal ganglia mediated are what's uh, driving things like anticipatory looking, you know, and anticipatory behavior really in non human primates. So these are all partial answers kind of around where you're getting it, but we don't have the answer yet, but we're trying to converge on that answer. Well, that was super interesting. Thank you. For um, I, I was really interested in what you showed with the human infants where they don't reproduce the actual phonemes, but yeah. they learn the phonological rules. And, uh -huh. and that sounded to me an awful lot like Chomsky and having a language acquisition device. Like, are you activating a parameter? Yeah. Yeah, that's what Gary Marcus would say. That's why we need those intermediate levels. I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you well, off. Well, I know. I, mean, I just wanted to know your thoughts about that. Yeah. Um, First of all, um, if that was true, the single word utterances should work just as well for that, and they don't. So that's one hint. The other hint is coming out of our data to 25, 50, and 75%. Um, it's looking, I mean, I, I, we're not done yet, um, but it's looking like it's actually graded, okay? If Gary or Chomsky was right, you would see nothing, 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 and then you'd see a parameter get set. Right. But the other thing is, in their way of thinking about it, is that you need a lot of exposure. They've never been very specific about how much exposure, but I wouldn't expect 10 minutes to flip a switch like that. Or you'd be flipping switches and flipping switches back, and it would just be a mess. Um, we're getting this on really short time scales. So I suspect that this is about picking up a regularity and using that to organize utterance and just not caring about what phonemes you're putting out. That's where I'm at right now with that. So interesting that that's what they tune into. They're tuning into like a rule or a gram. Yeah. But that's the thing that's predictable. So if what you care about is making your world a more predictable place, 
then what they're going to hear over a series of utterances is the underlying form. You know, and we know with work out of, out of just pure auditory perception, work out of Jenny Safran's lab, out of Rebecca Gomez's lab, you know, is that babies are very good at picking up what sounds go together with what other sounds. Okay. And you can do that with sound forms as well as particular phonemes. So we know they can do that. Um, we just haven't done that with the social stuff on top of that. Thanks. Yeah. I've got the same question, but from a different perspective. So one of the, you know, a lot of the early work on that was kind of corrupted by the notion of the transcriptions. Uh, yeah, let's, yeah. Kim kind of got rid of that a little bit. Yeah. Um, but then there was a really movement of speech was saying, go away from the vocal gestures and think about the variation of the concentration of the identity of the speech sounds in the uh -huh. Instead, in terms of differences, it can kind of tiny two gestures. So, um, having listened to hundreds of hours of conversations with these four zero conditions, I look at that the one was we were going to analyze or babbling, or modeling babbling. Really, what's changing there is not so much necessarily the, the structure of the place of the oral construction or the phrase, much of the difference in quality of racial and much in the because they're not coordinated in time in the very way the gesture of the Gotcha. The great revolution of articulated technologies needs to look at these frame differences in um, apparent differences in the last of the exchange, which really in terms of time rather than the, the nature of the, the place or the backbones. So it's quantitative versus qualitative. No, no. So, so the, the issue is that much of that much is sort of it's differences between the mature and the mature sounds. Uh -huh. the, the, the exclusively quantum time with the coordination of the vocal gestures rather than the nature of the vocal gestures themselves. So what I was thinking cool. that perhaps the reason that we're seeing um, uh, response to contingency evoking more of the genre of the syllable like speech like utterances is not because they're learning more about speech like sounds, it's because the contingency is forcing the timing. timing. That's so cool. That's cool. If you take, if you take um, the timing structure of an adult CDC sequence or something and you mess with it, you randomly jitter it, you get much, right? And it rapidly disintegrates. We learn not to do that. And so with babies, a lot of that is diversity is so, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. It's not really the fact they don't know what a phone is. They don't have phonemes. They're just not not there's a lot more variability of all this random jitter in the timing of their gestures. And obviously just themselves not to be sure. A lot of that much to do with that timing knowledge. So for me, it's not so much about um, contingency of timing creating you know contrastive acoustic structure in gotcha. language. Those trust with his charges are related to intrinsic timing. And if you structure the timing more at a macro level, the instance of kind of that's coming down and it's structuring the timing more at the final level. Yeah. So for me, it's not about the timing of the speech that was happening, it's about the timing influencing the timing. timing. Yeah. And so really, yeah. it's getting the timing all flowing together. And then you see that creating speech like others because it's by nature of the Sounds, sure. Yeah, I mean that's compatible with the way we're thinking about it. Um, it's just the. I'm the, sorry. Oh, sorry I, go I, ahead. I think that, that, that partly is, is part of the problem with historically the influence of the vocal development or at the first time work is in terms of segmented fields. Gotcha. Now in speech, you know, speech with ditched segments. So maybe I have a segment of phrase and about gestures and specifically well timed. Vocal trends that acquire the significance because you can see the consequences of the actions as sound. You don't hear the sounds, you hear them as time actions. Well, but really, what you're doing is you're perceiving time, act, time actions and you're producing time actions. Contingency is just another time, it's another kind of macroscopic variation or version of that time that then gets kind of sucked down into a different time scale by this trend of the the, 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 the it's a little bit like, you know, I'm not, I, I come out of fluid dynamics, so it's not like turbulence, where you just see energy propagating down to different scales. Uh -huh. and in the same way here, you have regularities of time on one type of scale. Influencing another. Because of structure or of different yeah. types of scales. And that's, you're different directions. That's, that's, really, well. that's really cool, though. I wonder how you get phonemic categories out of that. No, you see the contrast gestures and the intrinsic timing gestures. That's why it's... So 
it's a wow. Even the syllable is cool. fine. The syllable's fine. The word is fine. Like that. Uh -huh. But the no syllable, you have to jettison the bone and jettison the same. None of those phonological effects or what was it really effects expand the phone. So it, is this a motor theory with another name? Well, it's, it's, it's articulated with analogy by Ramon Goldstein, which kind of gets. Oh, the other Goldstein, yeah. yeah. The other Goldstein. Yeah, that means. <laughs> <laughs> from like Goldstein, because they would think about Lewis Goldstein or Michael Goldstein, which one do you think? Um, no, so it, it generally articulated with analogy. Got it. Generally. The problem is some of that kind of spiral logic is bad. It's just sure. very much away. Whereas really, it's the notion, again, it's the key thing that. You know, uh, speech sounds are the wisdom is going to be actions of the moment you come out and clean the entrance of the human being of those actions. Okay. What you're perceiving are the actions, not the sounds, and what you're perceiving the contrast is a large part, a very large part of the difference between the time and the time and the time. Got it. Can we step in here with something like that? We actually have a reception of oh, oh, yes. where we have. Extended conversations, and yeah. before all the, you know, everybody disappears. Um, I wanted to ask if we maybe could move this. Upstairs. Sure. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>